because I didn't feel connect, like connected. I was heading into high school. I just remember these like instances in high school, when I, especially when I first got there. Um, all these people would say these jokes and make fucking fun of all like my culture and that. And I just remember like I'd always laugh and join in, and I fucking hate myself for it. I feel like the biggest fucking coward on earth because like I just join in and laugh because I wanted to feel like a part of people yeah. like a part of something like because they were all like like friends and i had like friends and at the time like they're young and they wouldn't really know any different night either but they they knew it i guess at the time they kind of knew what they were doing but i would just laugh and i'd make jokes as well just so i felt connected into that sort of sense of heading into high school wanting to be accepted by everyone yeah G'day, g'day, welcome back to another episode of A Lot To Talk About. It is your boy, the captain of the ship, the man in charge, Bradley J. Drybra. You can call me Brad. Blessed to be here. This is the first one I'm filming for 2023, so I'm pumped about it. Here for a new season, season number four. And if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, please do us a massive favor. Subscribe to the show on your potty platform of choice. Give it a five-star rating, share it around, give it plenty of love. We hope that the conversations we're having here are inspiring and uplifting for the people who listen and connect with these stories. So if you think it could do someone good, share it with them. I'm excited for today's guest. Today's guest is a man I've been seeing around my local area for a little while. He's a St. George Illawarra Dragons player, a absolute big unit, a front <laughs> rower, uh, Mr. Joshy Kerr. What I'll say about this bloke before I properly introduce him and hand it over to him to tell his story is he's one of the nicest blokes you'll meet. <laughs> when I'm down the beach after a trot, stand around, I bump into this fella on many occasions and he's always so friendly, always says g'day, always down for a chat, always down to hear a story to share one of his own. And I absolutely love that. I think as human beings, we have a responsibility to uplift each other, to share and to connect. And this guy is just an absolute G when it comes to that. So from your home, your car, or wherever you are, give a very warm welcome to the one, the only, Mr. Joshy Kerr. Yeah. How are you, brother? Yeah, good, brother. Geez, I don't know how to fuck follow that up. That was pretty <laughs> That was pretty good. Geez, almost bring a tear to my eye. But no, uh, pr- uh, pleasure to be on here, bro. It's good to, you know, finally, I guess, get a chance to sit down and talk with you instead of being out there after you, you, we're both sweating our holes exactly. out. After you've run 10K, <laughs> I've only walked about 20 metres. So. <laughs> well, brother, you do your fair share of work on the field and... I guess that in in many cases for most people is how they're going to know you, right, from your time on the footy field. But there's a whole other side to you that even just off mic there, we started to chat about, right, your life, where you've grown up, where you come from, what inspires you and what's sort of driving you on this dream of being a professional rugby league player. And I want to tap into all of that today. Um, Firstly, sort of give us an idea of where you come from and, and who you are, I guess, in your years before footy, what that foundation was like. Oh, well, it's not much to me. I, I'm born in a little town, I was born in Brisbane, but raised in a little town called Narangba. It's just north side of Brisbane. Yep. No one has ever heard of it because it's like a little tucked away little, I'll say it's a little gem. In, on the in, coast? Uh, it kind of is. It's just a little bit in. It's kind of like where, I guess, Unandera would be from the beach. So okay, it's only, so it's, it's five it's like, or ten minutes. Yeah, not, it's not too bad. Like, oh, I'd probably, probably a bit further in, actually. What, wherever, the, I don't know. Like, I've lived here for like literally seven years now and i still don't even really know areas eh? like i probably is it kembla grange is that a bit yeah, further in yeah so it's probably about 10 15 20 minutes from the beach yep. where i grew up but i always claim uh redcliffe because that's where it's pretty much you know just over the highway everyone so knows redcliffe, everyone knows redcliffe exactly yeah. so yeah born and raised there um not much to me grew up north side of brizzy always sort of played sport because my parents just got me into it mm. because they always wanted me to like my old man was kind of the old get him into everything possible and um he actually started me off with soccer only because my old man would just go off what anyone else would say so he apparently he told me like years later he goes i got your soccer because i heard this bloke talk about it's the best thing for your kid so you go, oh yeah beauty fuck sweet so <laughs> yeah that's how i sort of got into i guess sport when i was younger and then i sort of um you know obviously like you said before a bit of a big boy so yeah, I grew up probably two, three foot taller than everyone else my age. So yeah. it kind of made sport a bit easier for me and a lot more fun because I was just kicking goals like, you know, like kind of like someone who was probably two years older than everyone yeah. my age. So it was a lot of fun growing up. But I was a, I was an example of the kid that always took PE as like the Olympic, <laughs> the Olympic okay, games yeah, at that school. Was me. So, that was me. Yeah, yeah, that was me. So I used to love it. And I was always that little kid that if things didn't go right, I'd have a little tantrum, you know, that yeah. little sook. So... Yeah, that's about me in a nutshell, really. There's not much 
to me, I'm pretty much an open book too if you do get to know me because like the, one of the worst things you can do with me is probably stop me for a yarn because, yeah, someone said I could talk underwater with a mouthful of marbles. <laughs> so yeah. I'd easily, once I, once I, I start... I wouldn't argue with that. Yeah, once I start, I don't stop. So, yeah, we'll see how I go today. Well, brother, it's so good to have you here. You know, talking about those early origins of where you come from. Narangba, was it? Narangba. Narangba. Yeah. You've obviously got Indigenous background, and it's something you're really passionate about and something you, you love to represent in those Indigenous rounds within the, the NRL season, and you had your opportunity to play for the Indigenous side. Talk to me about the foundations of your First Nations background and when you started to learn about that and understand that as a kid. Yeah, it's a good question. We actually didn't even talk about this before. Um, so when I was younger, um, I've got a whole fucking backstory to me, actually, but so... I've been very blessed by growing up with three families. So yep. my mum, she's indigenous. So she was the eldest child of her. Um, her mother is indigenous, but she yep. doesn't know who her real father was. So I think it was a it was a product of like a one. She was a product of a one night stand back in the sixties or something. And okay. um, so my mum doesn't really like to talk about it, but times were very different back then, especially for women and especially for indigenous people. So. For sure. Yeah, so she, um, unfortunately, like she had to be put up for adoption when she was younger. So she was adopted. So she was the eldest of her real mother's children um, at the time, or obviously the firstborn. Then she was adopted into a full white family, uh, but she was the youngest then. So she grew up until probably the age of, I think she she's mentioned it briefly about like 14, 15, mm. and then she was kind of... Um, told like look and we're not your real family and then i think my mum sort of had an idea too she was old enough and then but luckily the, the lady who adopted her um who i call nana osborne uh she was she's honestly like she's like a saint like an actual angel on earth like everyone who meets her just thinks she's the most honestly the most loveliest beautiful lady ever she kept all the clippings because apparently it was illegal so my mum was given up for adoption by a real mum but it was illegal for my mum's real mum to actually go and see her and be with her and even be around okay. her. So she, uh, luckily the one who adopted her, my nana Osborne, kept all the clippings of my mum's real mum and uh, found out all the information, everything she needed to know because she was a nurse as well. Mm. Found out everything. And then when my mum was like, I think like maybe, I could be getting this wrong, like eight to nine to 10 years old, started to connect with the real mum and then sort of mm. messaged her and then, would would play like would organize play dates and that with that which was cool and then um with so then my mum's real mum still had another family a bit after and then would introduce like so my um, nana osborne would introduce my mum in back into her real family but say that they were her cousins and that okay so it got to a point um where she just they sort of sat mum down and then said well listen this is um this is actually your real family yeah um you know and then so that was good, like back for her back then, and I, I can't really get the story straight. I, I sort of not really know all the information because my mum doesn't really like to speak about it too much and for yeah. obvious reasons. And um, we've never really like I've been like I've loved it. I loved having three families, and they're, sure. they're all like they're, to me they're all blood. So I love. Can I say the, as well how amazing of your nana was born to go? I want her. What's your mum's name? Angela. I want Angela to know her real family and yeah. and the way she done that and allowed time to you know, connect them, allow, wait until she was mature enough to then actually introduce them for who they are. And Man. like, I've heard of a lot of stories of people who have been adopted into families and the adopted family struggle to allow them to have that connection yep. with the real family and sometimes for good reason. But in this case, it sounds like, you know, for beautiful reasons, she wanted her to have that relationship with the mother. And Man, it's it's insane, isn't it? And, yeah. And growing up and like, obviously not, like it's like, I didn't even, mm. like I'm a kid, I didn't really even put, together like three families until I was a bit because I just didn't really know any different and it kind yeah. of sounds silly now but back then I was just very blessed and like it, all my all three families are like so like so beautiful and I'm very blessed with that mm. that they're just great people and growing up obviously my, because I was more sort of close with my nana Osborne because we kind of lived a lot closer to her it's, it doesn't it didn't like really surprise us that she kind of did that because it, like I said I just I'd love for you to meet meet him and I love everyone to meet my nana like she's just an angel on earth and yeah it, it kind of I kind of get sad talking about it because she's kind of getting to the, the end of her innings at the moment she's 94 and she keeps yeah, saying wow. I'm not making it I'm like just fuck stop being selfish and get to one just get to 100, 100. just get to 100 get that's there. mad 100 percent so I'm pretty sure you get a letter from I think the king now but it used king, to be the yeah, queen yeah so I just don't want it to go ever but 
honestly, it's just like a, it'll be an angel on earth once she goes. But so my mum was kind of grew up in this family and um, I hate saying it, but it's, say it's like a white, like a, a pretty full on white family. Had her indigenous family who she, you know, she loves and everything and close with, but it's obviously hard when you're sort of raised in this sort of family too. And, and I don't know, and I can't really speak on behalf of my mum, but growing up, I just knew that we're obviously a lot more closer with my Nana Rosborn than we were with, with my other indigenous side of my family. And, and I love them to death. They lived on the other side of town. It was a lot different. But my mum raising myself and I've got an older sister. Uh, when we were younger, we used to try and get into our indigenous dancing and that while we were young. And we didn't... Yeah. Look, as a kid, I didn't really like... Kind of, as a kid, I, like I look back on it now and I can sort of see it. But as a kid, I didn't really know like a lot, like what was going yeah. on and that. And like I, I knew what indigenous dancing was, but I didn't really feel like connected as connected as connected as what I should have been. Sort of, that was kind of in a, my early years of um, primary school and going through that. Didn't really, obviously, like I said, didn't feel connected. And we kind of feel, sort of fell out of doing all that sort of stuff. So when I was in like latest later stages of primary school, into high school, I just remember growing up, I didn't really feel like, I kind of knew I was Aboriginal, but then at the same time, like, like wasn't obviously so connected that I'd go through school and had these people that would be like, um, like you'd have all these like Aboriginal jokes and all these things that would happen. All these people would say mm. things like that. And I never really, because I didn't feel connect, like connected. I was heading into high school. I just remember these like instances in high school, when I, especially when I first got there, um, all these people would say these jokes and make fucking fun of all like my culture and that and i just remember like i'd always laugh and join in and i fucking hate myself for it i feel like the biggest fucking coward on earth because like i just join in and laugh because i wanted to feel like a part of people yeah. like a part of something like because they were all like like friends and i had like friends and at the time like they're young and they wouldn't really know any different night either but they they knew it. I guess at the time they kind of knew what they were doing, but I would just laugh and I would make jokes as well, just so I felt connected into that sort of sense of heading into high school, wanting to be accepted by everyone. Yeah, I'm someone who like wants that. I like being accepted, and yeah, it, it kind of was like it was shit. Because now I look back on it, and I think you fucking idiot, like you absolute. Because then you don't realize the impact that could have on everyone else around you. Because if I'm like sort of, I guess you know as simple as it sounds now like if i'm enabling that as a kid well then everyone else kind of looks at it and thinks it's okay yeah where it's not okay you know so i was kind of struggled with my connection to culture because all i just remember hearing is like fuck like they're drunks you're like on the fucking sidewalk like addicts like just homeless just fucking all this sort of yeah. stuff but then kind of i was very blessed that i grew up with like a lot of islander boys as well uh, my best mates is Maori. Mm. One of my best mates growing up was Samoan too. So I grew up with all the Islander boys, and they're very connected to their culture. And they it, they are, aren't they? they and it's, are. it's something I look at because um, we've only in the last probably six years, seven years, found connections to our indigenous heritage mm. as a family. And so, yeah. like when you enable Nan and Pop with an iPad for the first time in their life, that what do they do? They yeah. don't know what to do other than just dig into your family history, right? Yeah, like that's, yeah that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they start connecting the dots. And we always had, had photos of my pop's mother Yeah. and photos of her that like, you can't tell because the quality of the photos, but you looked and you're like, there's got to be indigenous background here. And like these photos, they grew up up north. So she spent a lot of time up yeah. north, um, Townsville area. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, man, there's got to be Indigenous heritage here. My nan started to search and connected a bunch of dots and found people in the family. And and obviously, like you said at the time, it wasn't as a lot of people kept it quiet. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people kept their Indigenous heritage quiet because they didn't want it to limit opportunities, which yeah. is so sad, but it's a, a fact of the past, right? And as we connected the dots and my pop and nan really dived into it, they're now super connected with the Indigenous community here in Wollongong. And Pop was actually invited to be part of the land council, and Fair yeah. Income. So, but he's getting a little bit old now that it wasn't the right move for him. But they go to all the picnics and they go to all the events, and beautiful. They're super connected with the mob down here. So, I get what you mean. Where it's there's this period of our history as a country that is so underappreciated, and when you look at NZ, they have this. Even the people who have no indigenous background are beautifully connected to the yep. culture that's a part of the land they live on. Yeah. And I wish we had that here. And I feel like we're getting better. Yeah. We're slowly getting, but we've still got huge steps to take to Fucking, get to a point where we all yeah. as a country come together 
and appreciate that. That's the hit the nail on the head. Like it's so that's you're exactly right because we talk about that in um in our indigenous camp because um a lot of people realize like if you don't know like indigenous you have so many different mobs and countries and tribes mm. that and a, most of them there's like over 200 and something dialects of indigenous language um that people don't or aboriginal language that a lot of people don't understand where then maori culture in new zealand they got one language which mm. makes you know it's so easy for them so I feel like we ever had that back in the day. If we all did just had one language, it would be a lot more connected than what we were, in, in, I guess, in, in terms of things. But, yeah, I think, like, their culture is just so, like, we always talk about it. Like, in, like I'm envious of it because they're just so, everyone knows all the same mm. dances, the war dances and their huckers and all that. And it's beautiful to watch when you For see sure. them doing it. And I love it. And their green stones and their tattoos and everything. We always talk about, like... Even, you know, like the Samoan and, and Tongan, like they, they're so like just connected in that one thing where we're so big as Aboriginal culture that is, it just sort of differs from tribe to tribe. But at the same time, there's a beauty in that yeah. where you go somewhere different, um, you know, like... So this is the thing too that I learned that um, you look at Aboriginal painting, right? Aboriginal like yeah. artwork and it says dot painting. Well, that was actually only one one tribe and, and uh, I think it was up in Darwin, up in yep. all North Queensland. So that was only one tribe, but then it obviously just got made out to be like, oh, that's what Aboriginal art looks like, where okay. traditional art, different places is so different to that too. But I guess it's a good thing because it kind of makes people think, oh, wow, look at that beautiful Aboriginal art. But then you think, well, that's only one people's country too, which right. is, yeah. I had an amazing experience at the start of last year. So I, I took a solo adventure for 10 days up to Port Douglas and just decided to go book myself an Airbnb and just go stay for 10 days by myself. Yeah. Just turn off social media, just like write, journal, and just go explore the area. For me, what popped out was I've explored a bunch of other countries with a lot of the time with my family, but I've never really explored my own backyard. And like yeah. we have such a beautiful country and such a beautiful culture here that I thought, you know, why don't I get up and explore, you know, the only place in the world where two World Heritage listed sites meet in the Daintree Rainforest and yeah. the Great Barrier Reef. And so I went up and this one day we took a tour out into the Daintree and on this bus with a bunch of people and we went to, first stop was Mossman Gorge. Yeah, okay. And we went there and there was an Aboriginal fella, Cameron, who sat us down, took us through a smoking ceremony before we went into one of the watering holes and he actually showed us how they paint. Yeah. And the rocks that they use to get the color. Yeah, yeah. Bro, it blew my mind. And like him and I got a photo together after and we're having a good yarn and just chatting about like the way that their tribe, their mob used to migrate through different parts of the land, yeah. different parts of the year. Bro, it was so fascinating to me. And there's actually still a mob there that still live that lifestyle, that that ancient lifestyle yeah. that they used to live and still migrate through the land. And bro, it's so interesting to me. Like, and it, you know, even through the time of our of our country's history in 2020 when we had those really bad bushfires, right? Yeah. And like it started to become aware and we started to hear the voice of the Indigenous community talking about yeah. the way that they used to burn off the land yes, to protect Yes, yes. No one knows life. that. Not a lot of people know that, do they? And that? I'm like, oh, fuck, how, how are we not learning off these people? How yeah. are we not allowing them to educate us on how to look after land that they looked after for yeah. 60,000 years before we thought we know better? Yeah. It's crazy, you know, because it? our country, Australia, like this land is so different to what the yeah. land over in the, in the UK is, to what the weather yeah. conditions in the UK, where those first migrants come from. Yeah. And so for me, I'm like, fuck, we've got like the ultimate knowledge keepers in our yeah. own backyard and we're not listening. Yeah. So for me, like connecting to that culture and understanding who we are at the core and and see, coming up to Australia Day, and I'm probably going on a bit of a rant here, but coming up to what we call Australia Day, 26th of Jan, for me, I'm like, we just need to change that date so that we can turn the pages of country yeah. and connect on a date that we can all celebrate Yeah. To, to then come together as a country and go, no matter whether your background is Indigenous, no matter whether you're as pale as they come from Scotland yeah. or <laughs> you know England or Ireland or wherever you've migrated from in Europe or whatever part of the world, Let's get together in Australia and now celebrate this this day in the history of our country together and yep. the full history. Yeah. And so there's so much we need to learn and and it first takes compassion. And mm. I think as you know, you were pretty hard on yourself as a child, 
but as a child you were so impressionable and yeah. when everything around you is saying one thing yeah it's hard to own your own beliefs exactly you know, and guy I spoke to recently on the podcast is an absolute gentleman and such a great character mr martin heppel speaks a lot about fitting in versus belonging and he yeah. said fitting in is when you're just going with the crowd belonging is when you are who you are you're authentic you own what your history is what your culture is who yeah. you are as a human being and you belong in the world because that's how it's meant to be and i think as a country we need to grasp that concept of belonging yeah. and come together no matter where you're from or what your background is and you know, we've got steps to take, but conversations like this help, right? Fuck, that's mad. Yeah, I'm going to be still on that for sure. Yeah. I have a sense of fitting in or belonging. So that's def- that was definitely me coming up, just trying to fit in. Yeah. But like, as I said, like just getting older and then obviously going through that shit in high school and whatnot, coming into being a football player and um, someone who helped me a lot with my belonging was actually Joel Thompson. I don't know if you remember him. I've heard really good things about him yeah, as a bloke. He People is, reckon he's a great fella. He's a great fella. He did a lot of um, community stuff. And when I was coming through the Dragons and then he was doing a lot of it, I was kind of, okay, well, I'll, I'll go back and try and find out some more about who I actually am. And then my mum was the same as well. Like she was on the same journey of finding out who we are and as people and um, connecting more with my Indigenous side of my family. And, like I, like I said before, I'm fucking so just lucky and blessed to have beautiful people and family members, and they all just want to help and just like yeah. it, like uplift you. And it has, it's really inspired me to just really. We've gone back and learnt so much, and then being able to take that knowledge and then take it out and spread that throughout, you know, like schools. We go to schools, and like I won't say like, "Hey guys, I'm Josh Kerr. I play for the Dragons." I'll say, "Hey, I'm Josh Kerr. I'm a proud." Aboriginal man from the Kwandamooka Nation of Stradbroke Island. Like that's what I'd tell the kids, yeah. and then the, you just see these little kids just, what, what is that? What are all these yeah. words? But then you get to educate kids, so it's pretty cool. And then getting like like yeah, just growing up and then going like uh, very luckily being picked up for this All Stars, my very first ever All Stars, going in there and then seeing how strong everyone was with their culture. Mm. And then going, fuck, like this is just, it was just all hitting me at the same time, like wanting to learn and then going in there and then being around the other boys that were proud of who they were and it makes you want to be proud. So then, then like, I don't know, it, was a, it wasn't a competition or anything. It was just seeing other boys and fuck how proud and how knowledgeable they were. I wanted to be like that, like Cody sure. Walker, Latrell, Latrell Mitchell, Josh Adokar, and I was just sort of shocked. So my journey's been a bit of a different than everyone else's. But um, I guess hopefully... It all comes together for one reason one day, I hope. so. And you know, brother, and that's the thing, like you speak of the pain of your past there and not appreciating it at the time, but it makes you probably more more aware of how you need to represent it right now in the present. Yeah. And, you know, maybe your impact now will be greater for the pain that you feel from the past and the way that you then push that message and, and share that message with the people who look up to you now, the way that you'll share that message and allow your children in the future if you decide to have any to understand yeah. your culture like that that's amazing that's the goal right as a yeah. community and as a country to yeah. evolve exactly man exactly so hopefully yeah hopefully like, i guess it's it's a lot easier to say i guess educate like you said when you do go through a bit of a struggle and we do have yeah. something that's hard and that you learn for yourself to sort of build upon and educate yourself and i guess grow from it's a lot easier than if i just grew up proud like i guess grew up with it all and didn't understand what yeah. it was like to not be like that and i don't know that's the only way i can see it now because that's all i've got and hopefully one day i can yeah like you said transfer that onto my kids hopefully one yeah. day so hopefully not soon but yeah hopefully one day <laughs> yeah still a little time to go <laughs> oh man hopefully yeah <laughs> talk to me about how old are you now joshy uh turning 27 in one month from today okay so you're the same age as me going in 27 in 23 yeah so we're talking maybe six or seven pre-seasons under the belt now. You're in the middle yeah. of phase two of pre-season, coming into another another big year of footy, hopefully, for you boys. Talk about where that footy dream started, and I guess if you want to brush through some of the early years of your footy and sort of start to talk about as the love and the passion develop, when this become an idea that this is a career I really want to have a crack at. Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, I'll try and I'll try and think of a way to cut it down because God, I'll just be able to talk all day for you. Um, so it kind of came when I was young, and like I said, like my old man and my family always pushed me to want to do sport because I think it was just a, a chance for me to meet people. Um, like we grew up, like I said, in Narangba, 
Um, but I'd always grew up in over the highway. So there's a highway here, ocean here, Red Cliff, a place called Deception Bay, which everyone called Depression Bay because it was, it was shocking. But um, <laughs> highway and then Narang Bar. But I actually went to school in D Bay or Depression okay. Bay um, and then in Red Cliff. So um, I didn't really grow up around any of my friends. And okay. I didn't find out the reason why until I was later. But um, yeah, I, I sort of just was pushing the sport. So it was, it was a way for me to have friends, meet people, um, obviously see how I'd go, I guess, sport as a young person. And like my old man and my mum were kind of sports people growing up as well. And so I was, they always started me off with soccer. And like I said, like my old man wanted me to play soccer because he heard it from some bloke like eavesdropping or something. I don't even know how we, how we got the information. But I started with that and then... It was kind of like a, like we said before, a little bit fitting in. Like all my mates started going from soccer to rugby league, and I'd always watched State of Origin. I didn't really know, but I just knew my family all loved footy, and everyone yeah. in Queensland loved footy. And I never, like I was so young, I didn't really know. And then, so we, my mates started playing footy at school, so I started playing. And then all of a sudden, like because I'm bloody, you know, three foot tall and everyone my age, I was starting to go all right at it. And yeah. then I was starting to like pick up on rugby league a lot more. And I was watching these people on TV. Like, I remember there was um, Darren Lockyer, Shane Webke, Petro Seven Seva, these blokes that I grew up idolizing because they played for the Broncos. Because yeah. when you're from Queensland and you're in Brisbane, you're a Broncos fan. Like, everyone yeah. just loved it up. It was just so. Moving away from home makes you understand it, but when you back go back, you just understand rugby league in Queensland's a religion. It's the heartland. It's yeah. the heart of it, man. So I don't know. I guess I just sort of somehow, as I was getting older and older, I was just sort of playing more and more. Um, I was making rep teams when I was younger, and that only you know, like oh, let's just put it down to my size and that because of you know overdeveloped kid, big gangly string bean kid that I was. But um, I was talking to you before about this. So when I was in grade six, we had. The two Broncos players come out, um, Corey Parker and Sam Thiday, to my primary school, and they had this NRL bloke that was with them. He was just sort of saying, who plays football in the class? You know, like they all do these days. And, you know, I was the kid, put my hand up. And he goes, oh, okay, well, you know, education's really important because the honest facts are that only 2% of you kids are going to make it. And I just remember going, fuck you. Like, I didn't actually say that, obviously, I was a kid, but... Um, yeah. I just remember thinking, fuck, they're just cutting you down. Like, you know, you love playing footy and you're excited because these, these, sure. these Broncos kids are there. Then you just go, oh, only 2% of you are going to make it. It's like, oh, well, fuck you. So you got to focus on your education, which is a good message to have the kids, but... Probably well, not delivered in the right yeah, way. Probably yeah, but not delivered in the right way. And I just remember going, fuck. And I remember that always, that has always sat with me throughout my entire career and especially growing up because I just remember thinking, fuck, like, I want to be like one of those 2%. Like, I wonder, like, what, what do you need to have? Like, what is it? Like, how do you be that 2%? So I just kept playing and playing until I was older and older. And um, I remember seeing all these kids who were actually way better than me when I was younger. They were they stopped playing footy and it just wasn't working out. They were getting injured, but then they were going out to parties and doing like silly things when they were kids. And I just remember thinking, fuck, is that what, what happens? Like, is that why they don't, you know, yeah. make it, you know? And then so I was pretty... You know, I was young and I, was, I just wanted to drink and that was who when I was a kid to fill out with, you know, go out with my mates and drink at house parties and whatnot. But I kind of never delved into anything a bit stronger than that, like my other mates were doing at the time. But I, um, yeah, I don't know what happened. I just kept going, but I always had that thing in my head, like, fuck, I want to be like about 2%. Mm. Like, I wanted like what it takes because then it got to a point when you're around the 16... 15 16 17 years of age they start having these scouts come out to your school games and to like the rep carnivals and that when you're younger and i was just like fuck this this could be it this this would be cool and then i remember so i was actually lucky enough so somehow backtracking i don't know how this happened but i got picked up like i was signed to the brisbane lions afl team since when i was 12 (laughs) don't know how but like it wasn't their actual obviously big squad but it was like a development team that they just watched we're playing like high, like primary school, high school yeah. footy, and then I was just, I, I was kicking like ten goals a game because, like I said, I was overdeveloped. Yeah. So they got me in on this like little development train and trial thing when I was twelve. I remember I was in grade seven, and I thought it was the best thing ever because my old man was an Aussie rules player. And then um, as I was going through high school, I was just still with them. Like I didn't yeah. really want to play AFL, but I was just doing it because my dad wanted me to and my mum wanted me to because it was cool. And then it got to a point when like. 15 i think i played the school carnival over in perth and 
I was luckily approached by the Broncos because they just, at the time, like I was like, this is the fuck, this is the best thing ever. It's the Broncos, like hometown team. But then what I didn't know at the time was the Broncos would take on like a hundred. They had something like, they had this ridiculous amount because it's a one town team. They'd had 200 mm. something kids. And I didn't know that. But in my head, they're telling me, mate, yeah, we want to have you at the Broncos. And I'm like, holy shit, this is the fucking best thing ever. But then, yeah, so I had had a conflict with, like, do I want to play AFL or do I want to play rugby league? And at the time, AFL was fucking so fun and so easy to me. Like, I used to just love running around. Like, I played this carnival. I was 14 or 13, and I got picked in the under-18s team with the comp and all this sort of stuff. I was killing it, so it was fun. Like, it was... It was just like... And you're physical enough that, especially in that game, you can bump off, you can... 100%. Yeah. And I didn't realise, because when you, we were playing against these older guys, and I didn't realise all this stuff that was going on. You can just start hitting, like, shouldering people, like, for no reason. Yeah. I thought this bloke was trying to fight me, and I'm not a fighter. Like, I couldn't crush a grape, mate. Like, so, I'm not going to try and pretend to be anything that I'm not, but I just remember thinking, oh, what do I... What, what happens? Like, what, what do I do here? And I remember just, like, things weren't working out for me. He was trying to shove me, and I stepped back, and he tripped over my foot, and I didn't even mean to trip him, and I'm just like fuck, are we, fight? are we fighting? Like, what's going on? I don't know what was going on. So this is a way old topic. But then, yeah, buddy, um, I just had this conflict growing up. Like, I was way better at AFL than I was rugby league, but all my mates were playing rugby league. Yeah. So I decided, oh, fuck, like, yeah, look, I'll, I'm going to head down this road. And then as soon as I did that, I found out, oh, fuck, we got, we had this other football comp the next year. Um, we had a football comp up at this country joint in Queensland and all the teams would take their kids out that they'd signed to yeah. dinner. And I went out to this um, this one with the Broncos. We had like 15 people in each position. And then you'd have these other teams, mm. like the Roosters had like, say, three or four kids. Melbourne Storm had like two, three kids. And I'm sitting there going, everyone's just looking at each other like, fuck, like, are you in my position too? And then, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it kind of got to the point, it's like, God, oh, I felt like I'd made the wrong decision. But... Luckily enough, somehow the bloke who signed me to Broncos left and went to Melbourne, and I actually he took me to Melbourne. So I oh, spent wow. yeah, so I spent two years with the Melbourne Storm, which was it was living kinda, down living down there. Well, yeah. Well, so I was signed in high school when I was seventeen, and I didn't know what I wanted. It was high school, you know, and, and I was my, my mind was kind of somewhere else. I was you know I was chasing tail in high school. I was trying to get trying to hook up with chicks and. Um, I just had my head was just not like ready for the real world, you know? And I, I just, <clears throat> I remember high school was the coolest thing ever to be signed to a football team because it's like Josh Kerr signed to Melbourne Storm. Fuck, yeah, cool. And I, I would fucking be like, yeah, man, like, yeah, it's so cool. And then like, I used to love it. But then when it came time to actually, all right, well, you got to move down. I was like, fuck, I'm not, I don't know if I'm ready for this. So yeah. I was originally supposed to move down straight after high school, but I stayed back one year because I just didn't think I was ready. Because, yeah. you know, I've, I've been blessed with great parents, but they've done everything for me. I was pretty sport rotten as a kid. Didn't know how to work a washing machine. Didn't know how to iron my clothes. Didn't know how to cook a fucking yeah, meal. You know, I'd burn water, you know, I'd burn yeah. water. So <laughs> yeah, I just, it was a big long journey. And then I, I somehow, you know, I ended up going down to Melbourne, moved to Melbourne away from home. And that was probably one of the biggest challenges I've faced ever mm. in my rugby league career where I actually moved away from home for the first time ever. And I moved to a town in Melbourne where... I moved down there. I didn't know a single person. I Where'd you know, move? It was called Ivanhoe, East Ivanhoe. Okay, It was yeah. on the like north right, is that north, east side, northeastern side of um of Melbourne, of the actual yeah. city. Up up towards, if you ever, do you know where Doncaster? Yeah, yeah. Was? I, so, I used to live in Elwood. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I know, I know of Elwood. I can't remember where yeah. it was. I, I remember Elwood. Yeah, so I was in East Ivanhoe and... Um, yeah, I, I just remember like it was the wet. Uh, the first thing that got me was the weather. It was dog shit because yeah, it was just bad, fucking. It? Wake up in the Cold morning, west. it was minus two degrees. Yeah. Starts raining, then all of a sudden I'm getting sunburnt because it's yeah, like, exactly. stinking hot. It's so. All over the shop. Yeah, it was kind of. I remember I moved down there and you got the blocks of preseason, right? So you do a six week block before Christmas and a six week block after Christmas with some trial games in between. But that's kind of how your preseason's broken up, and then you have the season ahead of you and I remember I got I think it was a weekend and I'd never experienced anything like it they had this thing down there called the tan track you know that it was like yeah. a botanical garden yeah so at one of our fitness tests was yet to run it was like three k's or something around this one circuit of it so you run three k's and I never like I was never 
used to running or doing any running whatsoever. I was just this fucking big kid that just took everything for granted as a kid. And, you know, I never really did fitness or anything, but we did that. And then I didn't realize you have a five minute break and you got to do it again. And I was, it broke me, immediately broke me. And I was just sitting there thinking, I'm not, I'm not ready for this. Like, I'm not cut out. This is too professional for me. And it's too hard. I didn't know anyone in the team. I was, the blokes who were already in the team had been there the year before and they'd all, it wasn't a click, but I just felt like I had that idea in my head that it was just a group that I was an outcast for. And they were all great people, but it was just my own head moving away from home and not knowing how to do anything. And I remember I was calling my parents going, I, I, I want to quit. I want to come home and all that. And then, you know, my mum my mum was like, you know, she was always in tears. You know, she was the kind of lady. She's such a motherly mum, you know, like she just, I remember I left on the day yeah. that uh, they dropped me at the airport and she was just bawling her eyes out and then she would wait outside and every plane that took off, she was crying. And I'm like, yeah, mum, I'm still here. She goes, oh, okay. And then <laughs> another plane would take off. She'd be crying. So she was kind of like, oh, if you can't do it, you know, come home. And then I was sort of, I think what actually kept me there at the first point, I was that shit scared of my old man and letting him down. <laughs> I was just like, I'm just going to hang this out. And then I remember, it was literally, I was trying to quit one day and I was living with this other bloke at the time. And then the next day he drove the training and then all of a sudden he played this Whitney Houston song uh, what's that how will i know if he yeah. it was just the dumbest silliest thing ever we were in the car because we both like you know when you, you're a kid and you're, you're on your way to football training and you think you're listening to rap music or something like that yeah. he um he chucked this this song on it was just so different and we both knew it and we were both singing it and because we started both singing it we were pissing ourselves laughing and then yeah. all of a sudden i don't know what it was but it was that and that and that's what kind of kept that me. connection mate it yeah. was just like that and yeah. then we went to training with a smile the first time i went to training with a smile on my face and then all of a sudden i just found it easy to start making connections with boys in the team and then even though i was still dog shit at fitness and everything else i just felt like a sense of belonging down there like we we're talking about before and it's funny you say that brother because i had probably a similar experience in melbourne i was a little bit older i was 21 22 when i was down there and I had like really tight family connections up here. Like me and my family are super close and really close with a good group of mates here. So I was going down there to no one except the people I worked with. Yeah. And my work was like demanding where I'd be in the office seven days, 12 hours a day, like big days. Fuck that. And because I had no one to go, I was living by myself in a two bed apartment by myself, like going home at 9.30 at night to have a steak, sit in front of the TV for half an hour and then go to bed. And I felt felt so estranged from anyone that I'd known. And I think because my mindset was in a place where this is difficult, like I'd built that almost a negative mindset where I was, I was not open to connecting to it. I wasn't open to it yep. being long term. Yep. It was just like come down here, make money for a while and then probably go home. And I think because my mindset was in that place, I really struggled. And yep. for me... I didn't find that connection point. Like I ended up coming back, but I fully relate to what you're saying where it's, it takes a shift in your mentality to then go, no, I'm actually going to embrace this and be positive. Yeah. I was so negative. Like I was just like, I'm, my head was set on quitting. Like I was going to quit. And then like, lucky for me, I had Whitney Houston somehow. (laughs) So I don't know how that happened, but somehow that just happened. And like, I think without that, I was fucking pretty like I was pretty set on quitting because I, yeah, I I just felt like I just remember feeling so negative and depressed because I just was letting so many people down. I had a manager I needed to tell. He did a lot for me to get me there, and mum and dad and my nana. Like I just always had these things where um, I don't know what it is, but I've just always wanted to make my family proud. Like where you just like I remember in high school, like I was vice captain in high school. Yeah. And I never wanted to ever do... I don't really like public speaking. It's like I shit myself. I, I, even now, like obviously I don't know if the camera can see it, but I'm sweating my little ring out at the moment because yeah. I'm so nervous. I just... And when I get nervous, I start talking heaps. I don't know if you could tell, but um, like my nana called me and fuck, I tell you right now, she's pulled that card out that many times going, I might not be around for much longer, you know, but gee, she just keeps kicking the old girl. So she goes um she goes oh look i don't won't be here for long can you just please try and do this for me and me and i oh, okay yeah, no, no, okay yeah. and then yeah just get somehow i just kept rolling and steamrolling and here we are i guess and so from melbourne 
you then found yourself at Dragons? Yeah. That was um, the next step? So what it was weird because... So I'm from north side of Brisbane, right? And up on north side of Brisbane is the Sunshine Coast. Um, yeah. So when I went to Melbourne, they always said, because they have an affiliation with Sunny Coast Falcons. That, okay. So they had this thing where like, the year that I moved down there was going to be the last year they held their twenties, uh, their under twenties competition out okay. of Melbourne because um, they they said it was because they want to build a relationship up with Sunshine Coast, but it apparently it turned out that it was going to cost too much money to relocate a whole new team down to Melbourne to set them up in houses and then play a comp out of there and fly them up yep. every day. So um, lucky for me, it was all right one year in melbourne and then the next year pretty much 20 minutes up the road at sunny coast which turned out to be awesome so um i did melbourne and then i was with melbourne again but then there was a lot of stuff behind the scenes where um you know like footy's pretty political and and it gets the points it's fucking backstabbing eh? a lot of people don't get that eh, in the media that people don't understand like i can't it's so hard to explain without sounding like a little whiny piece of shit but Mate, people just think rugby league is just oh you just get you get paid to get fit, which you do, and just pay to play like play footy, like what you'd love doing, which you do. But there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes too, and like people backstabbing and fucking saying like I don't want to get into it, but these are some shit that goes on. Um, I and, bet. Oh man, and, it, and it's funny because like this, all the boys have a giggle about what's going on like with them and and this shit. I don't want to get in trouble by saying anything outlandish. Yeah, so, fair um, play. Um, so yeah, like there was things there going on where like I was getting told from other people that the coaches there and they were saying like, fuck, he's never going to play. He's never going to play like Q Cup, which is like New South Wales Cup down here, like reserve grade and that. And I remember hearing this from other players and other coaches that these other coaches were saying about me that were there and things that were happening. And then all of a sudden, uh, this is why I'm living up at Sunny Coast. Um, I started to string of, together a few good games and I started building more confidence within myself, started building my game. All of a sudden, the telephone started calling to my manager about different clubs and then all of a sudden, you know, Melbourne want me. Um, I think yeah, Dragons wanted me. Um, there was a few other clubs too. And then, yeah, I, I remember just settling on um, settling on the Dragons. I won't go too far into the other story. I don't want to get much myself in trouble. Yeah, 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 nah, stuff, play. but um. Yeah, so I don't, uh, I just end up settling on the dragons, um, all because the big reason was like um, Melbourne had like the best team that was like yeah like Cameron Smith, but then you had the best front rowers in the game. Um, some of the people that were coming through were some of the best products that coming through. Like right now, you're seeing like Nelson, Asafa Solomon, and blokes like yeah. this, and like so I was just thinking fuck how am I ever going to play in that team when they got like the, one of the best teams they just won the grand final they're, they're one of the best yeah. teams in the world all their players are playing for their countries and that so um, there was that there was a few other teams but what stuck out for me with St. George was there's this club that had this really rich history that um, like my old man like always loved AFL like I said but whenever you talk about rugby league you talk about the Broncos but you always talk about back in the day about all these old tough blokes who used to play for St. George and the dragons and people like Craig Young and he goes, mate, they used to run with their elbows up and put it straight in your chin and so these pretty rough <laughs> bastards. But they had this really big success back in the eighties. Um, it's pretty well spoken about in the rugby league community. It's this team that was never before, never again, where they won ten years in a row. They call them the Invincibles. Yeah, they? the Invincibles. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, but obviously, um, you know, within the last like few decades, but they won it back in twenty ten. Um, with Wayne Bennett at the helm, with a lot of great players at the Dragons, but and since then they've they had sort of struggled to find success. Yeah, um, we still have. But I remember thinking, like, all right, well, do I want to go to Melbourne Storm and be, I guess, just a player that is kind of just there, and and you you know, you're like, realistically, I'm probably never going to get a shot at this club. Or can I try and go to somewhere like the Dragons who've had this rich history that you want to help build because they're a good club. Like we're a really yeah. good club and been around in the game since the beginning. And my mentality, even like then, like I was uh, 20, 20 years old, 19, mm. 20, I remember thinking, I kind of want to be somewhere. I, I would have more of a chance of playing. Yeah. But it was more the chance of like, my mentality always going into is I've always wanted to win a grand final. Like I did one when I was, Black playing with Redcliffe in under 20s and it was mm. an under 20s like Colts team and at the time for me it was awesome 
for the town, people kind of sort of knew for Redcliffe. But like to be an NRL grand final and win one of them would be one of the best things that ever happened to me. And that's what I've wanted. And I've wanted to always do it with the with a club that was kind of, you know, like they've always had, we've always had great promise in that, but we just haven't got there at the end of the day. And yeah. I want to, I feel like with us, it's only a matter of time now because we've got, we've yeah. got great coaches this year, especially great players, everything. And I feel like we're so close. I want to be a part of that. For and, sure. I, and I want to be that. And going into the club, there's always this talk about, you know, you have, we had Craig Young that was around at all these old people. I was coached by Paul McGregor, Dean Young, Matt Head, Ben Hornby, these blokes that were there, they'd been a part of it. And I just wanted to, I guess, sure. make them proud. I don't know make them proud, but I want to just do that again because it's, it's the Dragons, it's the mighty St. George Dragons. And we've fallen on hard times in the last few years, but yep. there's only a certain point of time. And it's going to, I feel like it's just soon that we're just going to, it's going to happen. And I just want to be a part of that. And that, that was a big reason as to why, you know, I wanted to come here in the first place because it was a team that was always struggling that could definitely do it. And I just want to have a chance to be a part of that. So that's kind of what drove me here. And then being, since being here, mate, like, yeah, it's probably like obviously out there and that, but fuck, we've, we've found ourselves in the media and done some silly things and probably don't have the greatest reputation, but that kind of just fucking mate in my head makes me just like how good would it be now to win a grand final after all been like everyone's, yeah. everyone loves kicking a dog when it's down the only way to sort of get back up is to fuck just get there and win one and just do it and I would fuck like that's just what I want it just fucking makes me so happy just thinking of it like just being in, on like the field and just like the confetti fucking flying out like 100%. I just want that I just I just want to be a part of that and we got you know not only do we have great players at the club now that can do it we got fucking great people I want to do it with people like Blake Laurie Zach Lomax I got fucking so many other people that are there that you know, Jack DeBellin, like Jack DeBellin and Blake Laurie were there when I first started and we've been the three longest guys so far. Jack DeBellin's been there for like fucking 15, 17 years. Yeah. I don't know, he's as, almost as old as Wayne Bennett. But, um, you know, Blocker's come through and watching Blocker come from the the young player that he was to what he is now, he's just a, he's just a fucking tough leader, a tough person. And you just rock up the training with these blokes who were great mates with you too. And I just yeah. want to do it for them. You just for want sure. to be a part of it. And I just, fuck. Like I love playing footy. I love it. And I just love footy. I just want I want the pinnacle of it. And a lot of other people do it. I fucking just watch Latrell Mitchell. He was 18, 19, he'd already won two. I'm like, fuck, I'm so Mental jealous. Life. So jealous of that shit, man. So Bro, I, I love it. And I think you can see, and if if anyone's watching this, or you could probably even feel it when you hear this podcast, like the energy coming from you as you said that, like it feels real, it feels honest, it feels genuine. And you can feel that that there is that genuine passion to want to succeed on the big stage in, in NRL. And this I love to cracker. hear that. This is a crack addict spiel. Man. Yeah, crack exactly. And I was fucking one. I just got that energy. Yeah, you, you, you know, I, just wanted, up, yeah, I, just I love wanted. it. I love it. Talk to me about, because, and this is something I've spoken to a few of the boys about, you know, Block and, and Zachy. Footy is a big part of your life. But what happens in footy sometimes can dictate your self-worth if you're not careful. And obviously, you're a human being off the field, right? You're a man who, you know, you're a partner, you're a son, yep. you're a brother, you're someone who's trying to be a role model in, in the parts of your life where you can. How do you separate your footy life and your personal life? And, and what does personal life look like for you? Fuck. That's a great question. Because, mate, I'll tell you right now, I'm a mixed mixed bag of marbles or something. You know, like sometimes, yeah. like, <clears throat> it's, um, you know, for me, I've kind of like always... I've always been like a all my eggs in one basket thing because like I said before about that um, guy coming to the school and saying there's only 2%, like I just wanted to make that work and rugby mm. league has just got to be my, my sole focus. Um, no plan B. No plan B because if you've got plan B, it means your plan A is not really going to fucking work out. So Yeah, I agree. Um, you don't really trust your plan A to work. So I just, I'm kind of like, fully invested into it but i've been very blessed in this last year i met a partner a great girl that you know diana and you know it's kind of taken my focus because i had a relationship when i first come to the dragons but i feel as though that was just a relationship to i met her back in brisbane back home when i first come down here and i felt like it was like an anchor for a reason for me to hold on to saying back home yeah and it was a relationship that was fucking so toxic like i don't want to get into it but like I don't want to rag anyone else out, you know, but it was just, it just wasn't for me, put it that way. And it really affected my mental state. And I just remember thinking, nah, this is a system reset for me. 
hundred percent balls into yeah. all in like for rugby league and um only because I probably wasn't mature enough and not wise enough to understand how to do that, how to separate my rugby league life and my private life. And like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, and I feel like I've, like my partner now, Diana, has helped me really learn that and how to really, and I'm still learning and, and I'm no, I'm fucking so far from perfect with everything as well. And, and the man that I am and she's making me better. And I'm, and not only is she making me better, it's making me notice things and want to be better too. Yeah. So I'm pretty like, pretty full on. Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like, like I never want to make my partner sort of second to something, but I've sort of always said as well, like, this is my everything. Like, this is everything that I've been. And that's what it was originally like now when I, like when I first met her, I was like, look, rugby league's my life. It's my everything. And I've worked, I've sacrificed so much to be here. I've worked my ass off to be here. I said, look, and this is just my life and I'm sorry. And like, there might be times where I can't go and do shit because I'm fucked from footy or I need to prepare for football. I need to do all yeah. these sort of things. And like, mate, like I've, like I said about my nana, like my missus is like an angel on earth to me at the moment. I've been very blessed to meet her and like she's understood that. But in understanding that and, and her being that kind of person to understand and work with me, it's made me in my own head think, fuck, well, like actually, you know, I can change some things about me to be a better person to her, my better boyfriend. And, yeah. Um, this isn't me simping over anyone, by the way. I'm just sort of saying, like, this is just me, you know, 26 turning 27, and this is me growing as a man. And, and it's crazy because I can actually see and I can feel and understand the way that, like, I guess this just must happen to everyone. I don't know if people have kids, like, as other men grow up and have kids and families and partners, they just have these days where they just think differently and they just go and I feel like I'm going through that and I've been going through that this last year with my missus of how to separate that football because like it, it does get hard too and I struggled a lot last year with it because I was getting dropped in and out of the team I didn't really have direction for me and I was going home and I was just fucking sad and if I did something like if I dropped the ball in a game I was, you know, like I'd have that, but then you'd have your phone and people saying they wanted you to break your neck and that because you fucking dropped the ball. Yeah. There's just people, there are people like that. And unfortunately, it's not like I'm not here to go, oh, these people are so mean. Like, fuck, it, it just is what it is. Like, just, yeah, you know. Yeah, for sure. So. But I, I get you, brother, because what you're speaking about is something I'm experiencing now. You know, yeah. with a partner, you, and I've never had like a, a long term partner. I always struggle to find someone that I felt really connected to. Yeah. And my miss is so for me I've I've become less selfish and more selfless in the process yep. of starting to create a life with someone because I start to check my habits, the things I'm doing, like example, you talk about being all in on footy. I'm so all in on storytelling and my purpose yep. in life that I'll find myself like whenever I'm doing something else, I'm always at the same time preoccupied with this stuff. So I'll yep. be listening to a pod, watching something, reading something, trying to reach out to a guest, trying to look for an opportunity to connect with someone. And I find myself, I'm never fully present when I'm outside of work. Yep. And then when I look to my side and I see her sitting there and she's so supportive and, and loves what I do, but I'm like, I don't want to be like that because I want to be present here for you. And it's actually made me better with my family too. Yeah. It means that, like, I put my phone down a little bit more. I try to get more involved and be more present around my people. And you're right. You just get to that stage of your life where you start to go, you know, in the next couple of years, kids are going to be something I think about. Yeah. Marriage is something I think about. Yeah. I'm starting to take those steps and grow up and be, and be an actual man. Yeah. A man who has to provide not just financially, but has to provide care, love. Yeah. has to be understanding, has to be present. And when you start to go through that evolution, it allows you to separate your work and your personal life a little bit more. Yeah. And, I, and I've found that, you know, partner to be a massive help in that. Fuck, 100%. And like still learning, like I'm not, I'm nowhere near finished and, and, yeah. and done all that. But I think last year was probably a good year because of I was just fuck like rugby league is a roller coaster and yeah. mine just happened to just keep going like that at one point. So and she was riding all those waves with me and that was her first real experience with um dating a rugby league player and, and understanding these highs and lows and the pressures of football and and all these certain things and and she would see and it, it fucking made me feel ashamed when you know people would write stuff see i'm like 
my posts on Instagram or anything like that and she would see it and it, like I don't care about me but fuck it made me feel ashamed and she was kind of going like that too but I think you know her both of us going through these different things too learning and growing together because we only just hit our one year anniversary like not so, but it feels like I've been with her for fucking 10 years like it just yeah. we've just clicked like that immediately and it just we're just in the zone Bro, like, I'm about to click over two months and it feels like I've been in a 20 year marriage fuck it's the best yeah it's, it's just it's, it's just when it's you know it's, it's just, just when you know feeling, isn't yeah. it yeah like it is it's just crazy because I wasn't looking for anything either at that point in time but I'm just I think everything does happen and I'm not like a religious person um I'm not against it or anything and I don't really know what I am, but I just feel like everything happens for a reason and yeah. things just seem to happen and everyone's unique in that. And I just feel like this has happened for this. I've just met her to just, I guess, make me a better person, I guess, away yeah. from football and not... Life is happening for you, bro. Exactly right. So that's just life. And fuck, I just reckon this is what's happened with every other bloke too and yeah. with, with their partners and that too. I just feel like shit, things have just happened, don't they? And Bloody earth. Fucking growing up. Jeez, it's happening too quick. We are, man. Talk to me about, you know, right now in life. What is the biggest challenge for you? What's stressing you, challenging you, worrying you the most at this point? Oh, good question. I think a big thing that plays on my mind at the moment is I'm actually off contract um, at the end of this year. And yeah. I don't know where my future lies at the moment. And I think it's just so scary because I've seen so many people that um, that are in my position too and, and then they might not get a go. I've seen blokes that have done their ACLs in this position and mm. you don't know what your future is. And But I think it's kind of a blessing in disguise because it's not something that's always on my mind this because I just feel like, like I said, my head's already around. I'm just going to keep, like my know where I want to be. Like I'll be signed somewhere. Mm. I'll, um, I'll be okay, but... I think it's just making me subconsciously just train harder and train. I think this is the best I've ever trained at, at football and yeah. um, learning, training, everything I'm doing. I think this is, it's just taking steps and steps and steps in, in the right direction. So I think that's probably the most, I guess when I think about it too much, it does kind of scare me and worry me a bit, but I can only, I can't control that. All I can control is what I can control like in uh, control so i think i just i don't know like i fall into the trap of like i'm a really big overthinker and yeah. I, yeah i don't know yeah so I, I think about things a lot and if i get stuck down this rabbit hole of thinking oh my god i'm, I'm off i'm off contract it fucking frightens me and it scares me because is this it like is could this be it could this be my yeah. last year of ever breaking my leg and never being able to play again might break my spine i don't know but i'm willing to go down swinging at the moment so i'm just gonna do whatever I can possibly, train as hard as I can and just fucking whatever happens, happens. You know, I spoke about this concept with a mate of mine this morning when we were running and the old Stoic, um, the old Stoic Seneca um, back in the Roman Empire said, we suffer far more in imagination than we do in reality. Yep. And, you know, we, we definitely as human beings can be guilty of drowning ourselves in our own negative thoughts. Yeah. And, you know, for, for me probably at the moment, you speak about uncertainty in, in the sense of your contract and you know being up at the end of the year. One of my struggles right now is my financial sustainability. We spoke a little yeah. bit about it before the show started. I'm at a point where I'm like, I can survive for the next three months without making any money. But after that, I'm not so sure how I'm yeah. going to survive. And it's like, well, you can allow yourself to suffer in the imagination of what three months time looks like. Or you can accept reality for what it is right now and just act on, like you said, what can you control? Yeah. Like what things can I control right now to make sure that there is food on the table next week, that bills are paid. And and I think as human beings, that's a real struggle. We tend to live more in the future than we do in the present. Yeah. And mate, I, I love to hear what you said, just using that as a fuel to drive you to give what you can right now today. And you know whether that's training harder, playing harder, you know, being more positive, it, it ultimately leads to, to better endings and better results. Fucking definitely, man. Because, yeah. like, I've done a lot of work with that because, like I said, I'm an overthinker, but ultimately I can only can control what I can uh, control. So I, I've been doing a lot of work with one of our blokes at the club. His name's Matty Elliott. He does a lot of stuff with a lot of other people. And yep. that even that has changed my life so much. Like, because I just tend to think, like, fuck, like, oh, why, why is he doing this? Like, why would he be doing this? Like, why am I thinking about that? Like, I can't, I don't have any control over that. Like, I just know, like, all right, well, 
like it got to a point because I remember last I was just like always thinking my negative thoughts and I was in this fucking loophole last year because I was like fucking why is he here and why why am I here and, and what's going on well I can't control this shit now and I can control this mm. and when I started doing that and I don't know if this works for everyone or whatever but it just made me happier it just made me so it felt like a fucking weight like I don't know how to explain it but it just I just felt clear and I felt yeah I don't know. I can't speak for everyone. I just, I just did that for me, and, and it just made me feel better and happier that I just worried about myself and just knowing if I just do the shit. Because I feel like, regardless, I don't know what. Like I said before, I don't know if there's a universe that controls energy or fucking God or whatever it is. But I feel like if you just work hard and do the right thing, something will always happen. And I feel like whenever you have a tough challenge ahead of you, it's always, you know, if you work through that tough challenge and you, you just sacrifice and you, you do it something will always come out the other side like like a lot of the people that i watched because my old man was just he was always showing me videos of these people who were success, like successful multi-millionaire and billionaires a lot of them started off like homeless and, yeah. and poor and they dropped out of school but they just they made it work they just worked hard so i feel like you know for me all i can do is control me and what i can do and work hard at something and i feel like if i do that i don't know what it's going to be but i feel like i'm going to be okay sounds like a bunch of that work with maddie elliott was around um sort of removing comparison mm. as part of your life and your mind frame and it it's funny blake Laurie will love this because he loves when i drop a quote but yeah. i was talking to a great mate of mine the other day bretto and bretto was talking about a guy naval Ravikant. And he listens to a lot of his work. He's been on Rogan and he does a lot of profound work in the technology space. Yeah. And he quoted Naval off one of his podcasts. And there was this quote that I loved and it was escape competition through authenticity. And it's like, you don't get stuck in competition if you allow yourself just to be who you are, to be the best version of yourself. Yeah. And for me, that that's been something that I've had to focus on. I think in my space, I can compare myself to where other speakers are at in their career, where other podcasters are at, where other people... In the, like, if I compare myself to Ned Brockman, right? I'm doing yeah. this challenge at the moment, 10K a day. If I compare myself and, and went, fuck, I'm only doing 10% of what Ned was doing, yeah, you'll be down on yourself. Or I can go, actually, running 10Ks a day means that I'm running 70 a week and I've never run 70 a week in my life before. So I'm on a new level yeah. for me. Well, think about what like, that fucking sounds like to me because that's incredible. Yeah. Like, that is fucking incredible. Well, I appreciate that, brother. But it's it's all about just looking at yourself and like the only person you should compare with is the man you were yesterday, right? And, yeah. And I love hearing you talk about that and, you know, the way that shifted your headspace and mentality. And I think it's probably a beautiful way to come to a conclusion of the pod, right? You know, we've been chatting for yeah. an hour now, which goes like oh, that. Oh, fuck, man. That went um, so quick. So quick. But before we go, I just want to give you one opportunity to, you know, if you could share one message with the audience and encourage them to act on it, to connect with it, what would that message be? Holy fuck, you've got me a beauty. Um, I don't know. Like, honestly, and I, this might not work for everyone, but if you do have a dream or something, or you do have something that you just want to do and like i oh know it's it's the same fucking quote that's like everywhere that when people always say oh if you got your own dream just follow it because no one else will see this sort of shit and that if you just keep working at it but like i know for a fact for me it's true and i feel like you know i could have just been one of those 98 mm. percent that didn't make rugby league but if you do actually have something you just work at it like it just happens you just get rewarded and whatever like i said god or the universe or whatever it is i feel like it just rewards you just for working at it at something that you want to do and like yeah the only fucking the only live once really don't you so i might as well do everything i possibly can for me because there's no like you don't just die and fucking respawn like a video game and you're fucking yeah. done so why don't you just do it i'd uh, brother I, lo I love that message and for me i think doing that in my own life this last two and a half years you know following what i felt was purpose driven or the dreams that i had that i at one point in my life didn't allow myself to pursue I've learned that it's not even the destination. It's just the things you learn along the way. Fucking like you 100. spoke about before, the evolution of yourself as a man. Yep. As you start to realize you're, you're changing and evolving for the better. Yep. And, you know, that's the beauty of the pursuit. You yep. know, that's the beauty of the quest is what you figure out and find along the way. And, you know, sitting here in front of you today and, and talking about culture, family, footy, dreams, you know, passion and life, I can see that the man you're becoming is a man you're proud of and... You know, that's a beautiful thing to see. 
Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that, brother. Thanks so, very much for having me on today mate, too. It's, it's been, been awesome. I'm fucking pleasure. sweating from stress. Hey, I'm not really yeah. good at this sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's not the stress, believe me. It's yeah. the studio yeah. lights. Oh, fuck, they're I hot. hope so. They're hot. They're hot. <laughs> Infrared so, sauna in here. How good? Brother, I appreciate it. I'm going to make sure that everywhere that the listeners, the viewers can find you on social media and connect and, and send some messages of love and support and connect with you and, you know, and follow you guys and support you guys on the field this year. I always say to the boys... I am a Roosters man at heart, you know, it's, yeah. it's been my, my passion, my love of supporting the Roosters for a lifetime, but I do have a soft spot in my heart now for the St. George Illawarra yeah. Dragons, knowing you boys, so, Shit, yeah. mate, con- you know, congratulations on all the success so far, and I'm wishing you all the best for 2023. Appreciate that, brother. Thank you. Cheers, brother. Cheers.